In 2018, the Trump administration proposed a policy of easing fuel economy rules for cars and light trucks. Their position cited on the stance that lower efficiency standards would make cars cheaper and drivers safer. But instead, the state of California chose to keep its standards on vehicle emissions, putting them in a conflict with the federal government, with car makers caught in the middle. The fight over emission standards is one of the multiple legal battles between the state of California and the White House. For the U.S. auto industry, it adds further frustration, especially with the ongoing trade war. Couple this with a reduction in sales and a rapidly changing market, which makes it challenging to plan for the future. Nonetheless, the political, economic, and environmental ramifications in this dispute are high, considering California is the largest market for light-duty vehicles. Approximately 20% of all U.S. greenhouse gas emissions are attributed to this category of cars. 14 states, including the District of Columbia, follow California's vehicle standard. As a possible consequence, the benchmark that California sets would ripple through the United States and even disrupt global markets. California has long set the rules governing air pollution standards, and the current presidential administration endeavors to change it. Since so many cars are sold in the California market, automakers either had to build cars to meet the standards of different states, or effectively let California dictate pollution controls for the rest of the country. To understand the significance of these proposed changes, it helps to explain a bit of history. California has received waivers under the Clean Air Act since 1968 to set stricter air quality rules than the federal government. This was a derivative of the smog in the Los Angeles Basin, which had a significant effect on densely populated cities in California. In 1975, Congress also established the Corporate Average Fuel Economy Standards as a result of a shift in fuel economy policy. This was in response to the oil price shock of the early 1970s, specifically the 1973 oil embargo. At the time, the average fuel consumption of cars within the U.S. was around 15 miles per gallon. In 2019, most cars sold can achieve 30 miles per gallon, with some even approaching 40 miles per gallon, and this is without factoring in hybrid technologies. The CAFE standards set the average new vehicle fuel economy as weighted by sales that a manufacturer's fleet must achieve. Subsequently, the alignment of the Clean Air Act and the CAFE standards set off political pressure to transition towards smaller vehicles with less powerful, emissions-friendly engines. This trend was initially unappealing as consumers placed higher demand and thirstier vehicles. Manufacturers took notice and started exploring technologies that would bring power and robustness back to their vehicles. Our primary focus of this video will not be on the nuances of these regulations, but rather on how engines became more efficient from a mechanical perspective. To better grasp how this was done, let's first examine how a gasoline engine operates. It's worth noting that the scope of this video is limited to gasoline engines only, though some of the principles do overlap with diesel engines. An engine generates energy by burning gasoline. This is accomplished by first introducing a mixture of fuel and air into a cylinder through the intake port. The total working volume of all the cylinders in an engine is known as displacement. The rising piston compresses the mixture and the spark plug is ignited. As the mixture burns, it expands, which pushes the piston downward, causing the crankshaft to rotate. The now spent gases are forced out through the exhaust port. The power generated is sent from the rotating crankshaft through the drivetrain, then to the wheels. With the fundamental mechanical operation of an engine established, we can now explore how to improve efficiencies. In order to increase a vehicle's fuel efficiency, a reduction in the energy it consumes to move it around becomes critical. The first strategy is a weight reduction of the car, with the idea that less mass requires less energy to move. With less mass to move around, we can now reduce the size of the powertrain. An engine with lower displacement and fewer cylinders that employs a small drivetrain would weigh less. The return is less energy necessary to get power to the wheels. 
An engine and a drivetrain that utilizes a dissimilar layout would suffer from an increase in parasitic loss. Parasitic loss is caused by the inherent mechanical inefficiencies of moving assemblies within the powertrain. The amount of fuel and air mixture an engine can take in to create power is directly correlated to its displacement and its number of cylinders. By decreasing engine displacement size, you reduce the power potential an engine can generate and also the amount of fuel it consumes. Manufacturers had to get smart if they wanted to increase power output but still maintain optimal fuel efficiencies. Their initial strategy was to control the fuel usage of the engine accurately. To accomplish this, we need first to understand when fuel is used the most and why. Generally, engines used in cars have five functions or modes of operation. Starting, idling, accelerating, cruising, and decelerating. Starting, idling, and decelerating all use relatively small amounts of fuel. So let's direct our focus on acceleration and cruising, since fuel consumption is at its highest during these two modes. From the engine's perspective, acceleration happens when the throttle is open more, allowing it to take in more air and fuel. This additional intake increases its rotational speed and power output. When throttling open an engine to make more power, more fuel consumption occurs. On the other hand, the cruising mode occurs when the throttle is held slightly open, maintaining a steady engine speed and power output. Because the goal is usually to sustain a constant vehicle speed, we only need the minimum amount of power output to accomplish this. This is where we can refine and improve the fuel efficiency of an engine. Most of the fuel consumed while driving is attributed to short bursts of acceleration and long periods of cruising. The key to balancing power and fuel economy is having strong acceleration characteristics and efficient cruising properties. An effective cruising mode can offset the acceleration mode, increasing the engine's overall fuel efficiency. The ideal ratio of air to gasoline is 14.7 to 1, which is known as the stoichiometric mixture. In theory, this ratio should burn all the gasoline and extract the most energy possible. However, this ratio becomes challenging to achieve in practice, mostly attributed to the fact that an engine only has a few milliseconds to vaporize and mix the fuel with air, all before combustion. As the engine rotates faster, the available time to mix the air and fuel drops even further. To compensate for this drop, more fuel is added, which enriches the mixture. This allows for more fuel to be burned, but sacrifices the ideal mix. Enriching is used predominantly under acceleration to overcome decreasing mix times and ensure maximum power output. But this comes at a high cost, since we're mixing in more fuel that could ever possibly be burned with the given amount of air. Any unburned fuel becomes wasted. Dialing in the amount of optimal enrichment is essential in creating power with minimal fuel waste. Now as for cruising, we don't care about power beyond the minimum need to maintain a certain speed. This is where fuel economy can be maximized. Since our power requirements are constant and relatively low, mixtures close to 14.7 to 1 or even slightly higher are used. This is known as running lean, since we are not utilizing all the air in the combustion. Running lean uses less fuel, but can be damaging to the engine. By nature, gasoline vapor is a very volatile. Within a cylinder compressed with air, it doesn't take much for the mixture to reach self-ignition. For an engine to function properly, the ignition must be set off by the spark plug at a particular moment in the combustion cycle. Uncontrolled self-ignition of the mixture is called detonation, which can cause overheating and damage to the engine. To prevent detonation, the chamber and spark plugs are designed to prevent hot spots that can trigger self-ignition. But even more importantly, the incoming fuel is used to cool the combustion chamber and control the rate of burning, which in return reduces the chance of detonation. Leaning out the mixture causes an abundance of oxygen in the combustion environment, making it subject to fast, hot, erratic burning, which increases the likelihood of self-ignition. This limits how lean an engine can run. The common factor of both power and excellent fuel economy boils down to precise fuel metering. In the second video on this topic, we will take a closer look at some of the other technologies manufacturers started to explore to optimize fuel efficiencies, such as fuel injection, compression, valve timing, and turbochargers. 
If you like this type of content, give it a thumbs up and leave a comment down below.